Okay. Welcome to the closing conference of the Reshape project here in Stare Elektrarna in Ljubljana. We will say a few words with Milica. This is Milica Ilic. She is the coordinator of the Reshape project from Onda in Paris. Hello, thank you. And this is Tamara Bracic Wilmar, who is, who is uh, from Bunker Ljubljana, a partner in Rishi. The conference already started two, two days ago in Zagreb. Uh, we had two beautiful days, which were organized by Pogon from Zagreb, which are Rishi partner, Mariana Rimanic, Sonia Soldo, and uh, many other people. <laughs> Um, but first of all, a few thank yous for the beginning. Um, I would like to thank the reshape community, all the reshapers, all the fa facilitators, all the partners and all the advisors for making this project happen. Bravo, thank you. <laughs> and thank you also to all the participants at the conference for being courageous and curious enough to join us even though there are many um, special circumstances that might prevent many people from coming. So thank you for being here with us. <laughs> but I would also like to thank the European Commission for being courageous enough and open enough to support an experimental project like Reshape is. And our local financiers, who are Ministry of Culture of Slovenia, the Ministry of Public Administration of Slovenia, the City Municipality of Ljubljana, and also the partners who helped us organize this conference, which is Electro Ljubljana in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Ljubljana. Thank you all. But also, Last but not least, I would like to thank all the Super Bunker team and the team of Star Electrarna to making this conference a reality. <laughs> a lot of thank yous. Um, just to give you an idea who is in the room, there is many people from the Reshape community. Um, maybe the, the best thing to say uh, as a beginning is that it's a, it's a research project, it's a, it's a research program that is aiming at developing alternative organizational models for the art sector and it wants to do so, it aims to do so from uh, or, or, or within a, a bottom-up uh, process. So it's also a program that was uh, developed out of a sense of urgency to, to adapt the practices of the art sector um, and to, to shift them, to transform them so that they can be more in line with the evolution of the society, with the recent evolutions of society, um, with the, the artistic practices and the evolution of the artistic practices, and also with the values that, uh, that the sector represents. Um, it, maybe the, the most important premise to, to note is that uh, and the initial premise that really drove this project was that uh, this conversation, the conversation of the transformation of the sector or the necessary transformation has to be led by the actors on the ground, by, by the artists and activists, by you, um, who are working actively 
on the ground to already experiment alternative models. The idea was that the models are there, they're experimented, but they perhaps need a, a larger scale and a framework that would help them connect um, on a larger scale. So this, this transition has to be um, imagined and also led by the actors on the ground. So that's maybe one uh, important premise. And another one um, which from the beginning marked reshape was that uh, we need a, a, a broader perspective, that we are facing problems that are far larger than, than our own local or national communities and therefore the responses that we may give with local and national tools may be not enough. So that we need a perspective which is transnational and goes above and beyond borders between countries but also above and beyond borders between disciplines or between uh, different kinds of organizations or institutions. So what we proposed in, in Reshape was um, a framework, a research framework, um, by which uh, a group of 40 reshapers, as, as they were called, uh, went through the process of um, getting together around uh, five common topics. Uh, these topics being sort of five major challenges for the art sector today, art and citizenship, fair governance, value of art in social fabric, solidarity, solidarity economies, and transnational and post-national artistic practices. And beside this framework of research that they had and, and support in facilitating their work, they worked pretty much on the basis of Carte Blanche. So they had the, the, the possibility to focus on whatever they wanted to focus, to refine their topic, to, to take it from whatever perspective they wanted, and certainly to, to create out of it whatever they wanted to create, with the only um, conditions being that they should propose tools that are realistic, that are sustainable, uh, and I'm missing one of them. But that's already enough. Reshaping <laughs> the world. So, yeah, so um, this work was done over a year and a half, stretched to two years research. Um, it's also, it has been done through a process of while well, getting together and, and making community. So a lot of it was about getting to know one another, building a basis for trust out of which we can uh, build common tools. So now we are at the end of this process. Um, the, the results are there. Uh, they are visible uh, on the website, in the book that we just uh, launched yesterday in, in Zagreb and, and which will be available, available. outside uh, at the registration desk. Everybody can get a copy. So there are, there are many uh, of these results, we call them prototypes. Um, they are um, very different, one from another. Uh, some of them are very concrete, some of them are, are more discursive or, or uh, more like um, a call for action. Um, if we were, uh, as we were talking also yesterday, if we were to kind of maybe draw a red line uh, through all of them, it seems that they are all playful, they are all poetic, and they are all ambitious, and they are all very political in the broadest sense of the word, and they are all calls for a transformation of the sector, but beyond that call, there are also tools for that uh, transition to, to happen uh, or to be accelerated. So I really invite you to look at them, to, well, maybe read them um, from the book or the website, and certainly take this time to also discover them. There will be opportunities tomorrow and the day after to test them or have just conversations. The closing conference is the closing of our three-year project. Um, most of the conference program in Ljubljana is open to the audience, although we kept a bit, bits and pieces, like small parts, uh, open only to the reshape community because after two years we have to reconnect and talk to each other as well. Um, at the conference, 
uh, you'll get to learn more about and also test the prototypes that Milica was talking about. So the, these proposals of tools and ideas that come out of the reshape process, these are scheduled, uh, as Milica mentioned, tomorrow morning and Friday morning. You can register at the registration desk and really come and see and test them. Um, you can understand better the thinking that informed also the, these prototypes, the themes of the disobedience of decolonization and degrowth of the future and the end, ends, are topics that make our public program, but they are also were transversal topics throughout the RISA pro project. And you can also experience artistic program here in Stara Elektrarna. The art is talked by Lea Kukovicic tonight, the first altruistic performance by Mare Bulls tomorrow evening, and the new production by the collective Beton LTD, Hopla Wir Leben, which opens on Saturday. For us, this conference is a very special moment and a very important step. Uh, the Reshape community will meet for the first time since almost two years. We will get to present the results of our common work and we will close the process, start evaluating it, uh, consider what we have learned, what we achieved and what is still to be developed. And importantly, um, uh, maybe last but certainly not the least, it's, it's also a moment when we connect with you, uh, with all the colleagues um, and perhaps allies. Um, that are from Slovenia or from abroad that are interested in, in these results, but also in, in the process of reshape. Um, I think we can't uh, kind of say that enough, that, uh, that reshape was not about the results, but it was also about the process that we went through together. So I hope that you can also jump on board at that. Now is the time. And uh, now we will leave the stage to our main speaker of today, Alenka Zupancic, and she will be introduced by Mariana Rimanic from Pogon, from Croatia, and we just wish you to enjoy the conference with us. Thank you. Thank you, Milica and Tamara. Uh, since this is the, the end of our project, we thought uh, that it makes sense actually uh, to open the topic of the end and uh, to, get, um, to get more details uh, of our understanding uh, of the end. Uh, so uh, I'm really pleased to uh, welcome you, Alenka, uh, tonight uh, here with us. So uh, uh, Alenka Zupancic is a Slovene philosopher and social theorist. Uh, she's a research advisor at the Institute of the Scientific Research Center uh, at the Slovene Academy uh, of Science, as well as professors, uh, professor of the European Graduate School uh, in Switzerland. Uh, she's also guest lecturer um, at the universities, at the many universities uh, worldwide, and um, an author of numerous uh, articles and books. Um, and her work uh, lies mainly on the intersection of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Um, and the, the speech, today's speech, today's lecture uh, is titled The End of Fantasy versus the Fantasy of the End. Um, and without going too much into it, uh, I give you the floor, Alenka. Uh, thank you, Mariana, and of course, thank you, um, to all the organizers who kind of included me in this project at the very end. Uh, this is the end. It's nice that I get the chance to say it like this. Uh, so it is, uh, I was not part of this um, reshape project that went on for a long time. I was invited here as, let's say, philosopher um, who, to, in order to, this was one of the let's say, um, suggestions that I could perhaps say something about uh, uh, the end, which was the topic of my uh, last book in Slovene, mm -hmm. at least. Uh, so I obviously accepted this, and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, well, I'm not uh, involved in the art world in the same way as many of you are, so this talk will be will come from elsewhere. It will be a kind of a, okay philosophical reflection, mostly on let's say the times we live in, uh, which of course include the times that art lives in. But still, it is a, uh, it, I will not directly address uh, um, artistic practices and art, but I will talk about it a little bit also. 
but then I also hope that some of the things that I will be discussing or presenting or some ideas, uh, thesis that I will be launching here would uh, speak to you in some, will speak to you in some ways that uh, could be productive or interesting for uh, what you do in different ways in, uh, through different projects. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I think I will simply start and I will start by first explaining uh, briefly how I use the term fantasy here. So just to avoid the possible misunderstanding, um, I don't use it in this broader sense of uh, imagination or fiction, uh, but more in this psychoanalytic sense of the term, and even more Lacanian sense of the term, uh, which basically refers to phantasmatic support of a given reality. So fantasy is not the opposite of reality. It's not an imaginary uh, thing, uh, simply, uh, but functions as an important part of this same uh, reality. Uh, fantasy is also not simply a kind of subjective scenario waiting and wanting to get, wanting to, uh, wanting to get realized. Uh, but it participates in reality exactly as fantasy. Not, uh, this is the, the role it has is precisely that of the fantasy. So what prevents fantasy from being fulfilled is not simply our fear, I don't know, our lack of nerve or lack of opportunity, but above all, the fact that fantasy fully uh, fulfills its role such as it is, namely as, as fantasy. And to take a simple example, uh, I don't know if I fantasize about suddenly dying and my unfaithful lover being devastated by it, this doesn't mean that deep down I want to die or kill myself, but don't have the nerve to do it. What it means is that what I want to see through this window of fantasy, that is to say through this otherwise impossible perspective that this fantasy opens on my reality, the perspective of seeing myself dying, usually not very possible. Um, so I want to see the other suffer because of losing me. I want to see him realize why this loss, how Um, of, uh, um, I'm sorry, I lost the thread. This construction of an impossible gaze uh, or impossible viewpoint from where I observe the content of this fantasy scenario. For the enjoyment related to fantasy is not simply in that content, uh, it is not part of the phantasmatic reality, but pertains precisely to its contemplation. It is my seeing it that provides me with enjoyment, not my doing it. Or to take another commonplace example, I don't know, sexual fantasies that support masturbatory activity are in the service of this same activity. They are not indicators simply of what people would really like to do if they had or dared uh, to do it. So uh, this very contemplative or passive structure, in this very passive structure, fantasies have their own reality, their own actuality. They are not the, the opposite of it. So imagining their scenario unroll is a direct source of pleasure. And when people do, in fact, enact fantasy scenarios, which also happens, uh, they do exactly this, uh, enact them, stage them, play as actors in their own theater, which they are simultaneously directing and observing. So to enact a fantasy involves, so to say, watching it unroll in the head, seeing it unroll. And this is what precisely constitutes the condition of enjoying it. But on the other hand, if people unexpectedly find themselves in a reality that enacts their fantasy independently of their machinations, this can be truly devastating. 
not at all a kind of a final accomplishment of all their desires. And we should perhaps just add another crucial feature of fantasies, namely that they obfuscate or screen off a certain impasse or structural impossibility of the reality to which they belong. And this is perhaps their fundamental function, particularly when it comes to social and political uh, fantasy. I don't know, if you think about uh, anti-Semitic fantasy of the Jews or some other foreigners contaminating our sound national body, this is precisely the fantasy that obfuscates the antagonisms and contradiction inherent in that same body by transposing it to this figure of the Jew or, or someone else. But it has these anti-Semitic fantasies have the structure of fantasy. So uh, this is how, just to say how I use the word fantasy here. Now let's move to the fantasies of the end that define late capitalism. That is these different catast catastrophe scenarios uh, that for a time proliferated in public imagination especially thanks to, to Hollywood and certain mass media. And when I say late capitalism, I don't mean the present moment, which, as I will argue in the second part of my talk, already presents us, I think, with a different configuration. I'm referring to the last decades, let's say, of the past century, roughly, and the first decade or decade and a half of this century. Um, so. I think we can say that late capitalism is or was framed by two different kinds of narratives of the end. One was the famous thesis by Francis Fukuyama published at the end of the Cold War that we are, we in the West, of course, have reached the end of history. You probably all know this story. Uh, and this Fukuyamian end has nothing catastrophic in itself. It is more like a happy ending. Finally, at the end of history, we have reached the peak of what was possible to achieve, and, so, and now we can live in this happy ending. So he, he says, he writes, for example, what we may be witnessing is the end point of mankind ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. You can see how, I mean, this was written a little bit more than 30 years ago, but it already sounds very, very old, very, from a very, very different world, actually. So capitalist liberal democracy, as existing at that time in Western Europe and the US, was declared the best possible form of human society, no longer carrying in itself any serious contradictions. Um, so you can see how this idea of the end of history, uh, what it marks is not the idea that, uh, of a disappearance of the world such as we know it, its end, but rather, and paradoxically, the impossibility to end, the impossibility to end this end. We seem to be stuck with the end itself, stuck with this end of history and its endless and eventless perpetuation. Uh, <clears throat> this also implies the impossibility to end capitalism or the impossibility for capitalism as we know it to come to an end. In other words, what this thesis presents us with is not so much a closure as it is an enclosure. And I think it does describe well a certain feeling that was shared also by the critical audience, but this kind of feeling of enclosure that nothing can really happen, that whatever happens is immediately used to some kind of uh, reactionary purposes and that so that there is no way out, that we are being locked in something. Caught in this endless temporality of the end. Um, so this of course was also the moment when the idea and the ideology of the of another end, the end of ideologies emerged in full swing. You remember, uh, and as many have pointed out, the end of ideology basically meant the triumph of one hegemonic ideology. And this ideology again con consisted mostly in systematically denying any serious social antagonisms and contradictions intrinsic to the one hegemonic order. So, 
And not surprisingly, this systematic denial of antagonisms and contradictions inherent to the liberal capitalism has been fortified by, by its reality, which had been for decades that of a triumphant expanding, you know, both economic, political, and so on, uh, capable of successfully absorbing these contradictions. And this went on roughly till the crisis of 2007-2008, related also to this bursting of financial loan-based bubbles, uh, after which things, although they were for a while put back on trails, but they started deteriorating more and more. Uh, but before that, the reality of capitalism was that of expanding, growing, and becoming more and more unassailable in the process. Even though its contradictions were becoming increasingly visible, they didn't seem to be able to endanger its endless perpetuation, that is to prevent capitalism as we knew it from endlessly perpetuating the end of history. So these endless end times I think played an important role in how the idea of a possible change has been structured for a long period of time, namely as necessarily related to some cataclysmic, catastrophic event or end. Any kind of serious transformation can only come from the great outside, whereby this outside now basically meant something like, like natural universe as opposed to historical social universe when we were stuck in this end of history. And this uh, scenario usually involved a more or less total destruction uh, of the earth, a kind of extinction event, the end of the world. Uh, uh, for example, the earth will be hit by a asteroid, uh, the core of the earth will explode. Just think, I don't know, of blockbusters like Armageddon, Deep, Deep Impact, they both came one in the same year, 1998, at the peak, so to say, of this end of history times, or the core Independence Day, 2012, this is the title, 2012, the day after tomorrow, and so on. They, they all have this stage, this same fantasy. And as Fred Jameson remarked in relation to the popularity of these films, and you probably know this is a well-known um, point, that people can more easily imagine the Earth being hit and destroyed completely by an asteroid than they can imagine a consequential transformation of the determining social, political, but also economic coordinates of our everyday life. We can more easily imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So, for a long time, we were living in the configuration best described as our being caught between two ends. An end that seemed to be able to go on forever, an end that couldn't end, the endless perpetuation of more or less the same, often inspiring some kind of boredom and a kind of ontological fatigue even, uh, and the proliferation of fantasies of the end related to some kind of ultimate catastrophe scenario, total extinction. And we could say that the malaise linked to the impossibility of anything else but what is taking place was kind of displaced and returned as this fantasy of catastrophic event changing everything. And of course, if I say fantasy, it is not because these events were only imagined, but again, because of the way in which this fantasy relates in its structure to the reality of late capitalism and its growing contradictions. To put it very simply, uh, the idea of even the most radical definitive, or especially of a definitive irreversible end situated at some point in the near future, serves as a phantasmatic framework or perspective through which we actually contemplate and interpret our present reality. It is in contrast to this. And it often serves as means of uh, the ideological consolidation of this very reality. It serves, for example, to give us an idea of just how much would be needed to change our present reality. 
it's present whatever troubles and uh, discontents. What is it that has to end in order for our present troubles to end? No less than the fatal explosion of the earth. So from there, you, can, you could have your pick. We can either decide that somehow we prefer nothing to change, since change and catastrophe are configured as one and the same thing, or else we can find consolation in the fact that it will all be taken care of anyway by this same cat uh, catastro catastrophe as an inevitable end. And then perhaps something new can begin. This is the kind of optimist twist, the silver lining uh, of the catastrophe scenarios, this kind of potential that perhaps by some kind of event of this uh, kind, we can finally, or the, the Earth could finally get emancipated from ourselves, that there is this kind of, uh, only then something really different could start. So in any case, these fantasies, I think, work on two levels. They clearly affirm that change is catastrophe, yet they still provide us with some excitement in the, in the, in the change or in this kind of uh, playing with this idea. Uh, at the same time, they screen off and divert our attention precisely from the catastrophe expanding and taking place at the very heart of our everyday reality. The, this growing catastrophe that was kind of uh, building up almost like a volcano till, till, as I said, 2007, 2008. So, and you know, usually there is at the end of this cat uh, cataclysmic end of the world scenarios, there is this narrow escape from the catastrophe, which consolidates the world such as it is, kind of reconciles us with it after all the excitement uh, uh, with this word that has, that had no way out. Or put in one phrase, fantasies of the end and of the end of the world belong to and maintain this same world. They are not uh, from somewhere else. So talking of the cinema production, there is one notable exception and it is probably no coincidence that it comes from, well, an artistic filmmaker. Uh, I say this because art usually does not have the structure of fantasy in the sense that I described, uh, and actually works rather as something that in one way or another traverses this fantasy, puts an end to it. Um, so it doesn't work usually in the sense of functioning as a necessary support or complement of, of reality, but as something else, something that is disturbing even when beautiful, or perhaps something even more when it's beautiful. So it's not, it doesn't function as fantasy. And so the, the film that I have in mind, you have probably guessed, uh, it's kind of obvious, is uh, uh, Lars von Trier's Melancholia, uh, which chooses the path of kind of crashing the fantasy of the end, first by simply realizing it, by fulfilling it in the sense of going all the way. It's not nothing, I mean, this, the catastrophe is not, does not get to be prevented. Uh, so you probably know the story, uh, this planet called Melancholia is expected to collide with the Earth and it eventually does at the end. Um, in taking uh, away much of the excitement in fearing and attempting to prevent the end, the movie plunges us in the melancholic enjoyment and anxiety of its inevitability. In, 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 inevitability. It is inevitable. This is the kind of a, um, texture that we get from it. It is kind of a suffocating um, uh, feeling. So it's laid out in slow motion rather than in the usual race against time mode. But the movie does not crash the fantasy simply by going all the way, that is by letting the end actually take place, the earth being destroyed. Uh, but even more so, I think by the formal means it uses to tell the story, namely through the perspective of uh, these two sisters, 
Justine and Claire, and the movie has two parts. First is called uh, Justine and the second Claire. So one of the sisters, let's say normal Claire, uh, played by uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg, uh, and the other is less normal, let's say it's a, she's the victim of a debilitating melancholy, melancholy depression. This is Justine, played by Kirsten Dunst. Um, and what is interesting here is that this impossible standpoint, impossible perspective from which in fantasy one contemplates one's own peril, one's own death, appears in this case within the film, within the film's frame, as subjective rather than their neutral standpoint of one of the protagonists. So Justine is this kind of passive observer of what is going on. Mm. We could say perhaps Justine is fearless because made insensitive and numb by the ongoing demands of normal life precisely. She's married, she has some life. Uh, these demands are deemed to have a sadistic quality or effect in the movie, I guess, judging from the heroine's name, Justine after Marquis de Sade's novel, and uh, this was exp explicit reference. Uh, so uh, these have a kind of uh, sadistic quality or effect in the form of severe melancholic depression that they induce. So they make her cal calmly embrace the, the, the disaster and produce uh, the impossible figure in the, in the movie of kind of seeing, observing oneself die, which kind of happens there because she, uh, she's not overwhelmed. Instead of being overwhelmed by uh, this moment pulled into its vortex. In other words, the film kind of stages, uh, I would say, fantasy within fantasy. And um, we will now look at a short clip of the very final scene of the movie. Just for just a moment, for these who haven't seen it, just to explain the context. So, uh, um, apart from the two sisters, there is also Claire's son in this scene, Leo. Uh, he's frightened, he was frightened, aware that the mel melancholia uh, is very close and the, the, the clash is imminent. Um, but he is reassured by Justine who uses his innocence in order to soothe him, saying that they can be safe in a magic cave. And you have here another way of fantasy within fantasy, a magic cave. So they gather branches and sticks to build a cave in the form of a tipi tent without canvas. And this magic cave stands in the middle of the field. Uh, Leo, Justine, and Claire then sit in this. This is the very final scene, holding hands. And as melancholia draws near, strong winds uh, break out and so on, um, the, the, the violence of it starts. Uh, Leo believes in the magic cave and closes his eyes. Claire, the other sister, is terrified, cries profoundly. She's really uh, taken in by it. Whereas Justine watches them both and accepts her fate uh, calmly and stoically not uh, without compassion, but with this kind of extremely composed calm. Uh, and in this last shot that we will see, uh, they sit in this me uh, meditative posture, um, and uh, in a cer some certain point just before the, the clash, Claire actually breaks away from their handhold and just despairs alone. Then melancholia collides with the earth, sending a wall of fire through the field, vaporizing the trio and cutting the screen black. Okay, so let's now uh, have a look at this clip, please.
I, I won't uh, go into, there are many things that could be said about this scene and the rest of the movie, but uh, what I just want to kind of hang on in this moment is this, at the very end, when Claire breaks away, kind of she can no longer hold hands, because even at that final moment, she's still kind of part of the world. She cannot stand what is happening, the, the calamity of it. And it is Justine's uh, calm, although not unpassionate gaze on her struggling sister and the oblivious child that makes, I think, the scene almost unbearable to watch. Uh, plus, of course, the music, the prelude, uh, Wagner's prelude to Tristan and Isolde. Uh, so, but particularly, I think it's precisely the, this gaze from within that makes it all the more, if uh, Claire was just, were just struggling, uh, it wouldn't have the same effect. But this kind of uh, gaze within this tent, this, uh, I think it is precisely our gaze. This is how we usually observe such calamities in movies, but also outside it, if, from this kind of fantasy frame. Not at all unmoved or without compassion, but nevertheless, as, is, as if from another world, from the outside. In other words, I would say that um, Justine's is the impossible, phantasmatic gaze uh, that appears within its very frame. Now, the question is, does this make the scene less phantasmatic? I don't know. In a way, I would rather say that it makes it unbearably phantasmatic, uh, if this wording makes uh, any sense to you. I think that uh, here, three are moves away from fantasy with precisely an incredible infusion, intensification of, uh, of fantasy in this sense, by way of pushing uh, its limit. And I think this is true also for some other of his movies or some scenes in his movies. So in its representations of the end, uh, melancholia is in a way pure, unashamed fantasy. It's extremely beautiful also, it's painfully beautiful. But precisely as such, the fantasy no longer serves any other purpose. In particular, it doesn't serve as some kind of ideological support of, of any reality. It is something is simply too much in it. It just kind of uh, cuts us off, whatever this uh, means, or it, but it actually does has this effect, I would say. And. Uh, the end of the world movies, you know, that are, they are mostly action movies. Uh, and I think von Trier has a great talent for bringing out the unmovable, impassive side of all this action and excitement. The unbearably passive enjoyment also adhering to it. It is not simply, as we were able to read when uh, the film came out, uh, that he decided not to make a disaster movie, but rather a movie examining uh, human psyche during a disaster. I would say that more than anything else, it is about the psychology of disaster movies or the psychology of imagining the disasters, psychology of disaster fantasy. Uh, it kind of brings together the two levels usually held apart. Uh, the happy end of history inducing unbearable depression, we could say, and the fantasy of the extinction event of the end of the world as inseparably related. Uh, okay, this for this first configuration. Now I will move to the second part of my paper and I would claim that, that today the configuration is different. That the end of history has come to an end and also many people, including, for instance, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, also talk about the end of capitalism as we knew it and its replacement with uh, techno-feudalism. So I won't uh, explain now what uh, exactly is meant by this. We can return to this later in the discussion, but there is the idea that there is a profound change in how capitalism works and that it is no longer even justifyingly being called capitalism. The, the, but we can, uh, if you're interested, we can come to this uh, later. I just don't want to uh, speak for too long. 
So generally speaking, the idea of the end of history uh, has lost its grip and its support in reality. Uh, things, uh, the economic, the political, the natural order are changing. We will, they are reshaping, so to say, uh, and both from within and from without. And in a way, climate change and the COVID pandemic are emblematic of this melting together of the previously separated inside and outside. You remember I said that the idea that the change cannot come from the inside, only from the outside, this is now no longer so. They are melting together. There is this melting together of it's a human, social, historical, and the natural kind of jointly transforming the world as we know it, as we knew it. Um, also, the, the gloomy, catastrophic predictions related, for example, to the climate change are not end-oriented, but involve temporality, duration, floods, droughts, extreme temperatures, mass migrations, wars, and so on. They do not predict that the Earth will suddenly explode, but that, that there will be a lot of ongoing, lasting suffering and struggle. And also, this end of capitalism, if we uh, call it this way, the capitalism as we knew it, also does not amount to the end of the world, nor, of course, to some kind of socialism. But considering the direction it has now, this ending, um, it would result in a world extremely hostile to the vast majority of people, and particularly the, the, the weakest. Um, so let me first say something about the, this paradoxical time pressure that we are in, uh, the frequent reminder that the time is running out, the time for action is running out. Uh, this trope is at the same time true, but also somehow misleading, I would say, and it kind of still belongs to this old configuration where the question was how to prevent the catastrophe or the change. It suggests that the change will occur if we don't act immediately. However, I think we really need to first acknowledge that it has already too late to prevent the change, that the change has already started. Um, not necessarily the change we wanted, but a very profound structural change. Uh, and the end point of the world as we knew it is behind us, is already behind us. And this is why we see nothing on the horizon, no approaching asteroid, no distinctive end point before which we, could, we would need to act. And this is also precisely, I think, why most people persist in a kind of relativistic disbelief, feeling a lack of urgency rather than immediate urgency. Moreover, there is a persistent denial, I would say precisely, of the change which is taking place as we speak. And this phrase, denial of the change, I think would be a good way to describe the bottom line of most of the now flourishing conspiracy theories. Nothing changed, the world as we knew it didn't end, only they, the elites or whatever, are just trying to convince us that it did. They're putting up a show so that they could go on profiting from it or profit from it even more. Um, and uh, my thesis here would be, and I will try to argue it a little bit, that um, conspiracy theories actually correspond to and complement com uh, this new configuration of profound structural change in the same way that fantasy of the explosive end did complement the, this immovable end of history. So the, this is now the, the, this other duo that uh, took the, 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 the stage. Um, just to if you think of it a little bit, bottom line of many different conspiracy theories related to the present situation, is simply this. Uh, uh, liberal elites have invented uh, climate change and now particularly the COVID-19 to maintain their power and grip over the world. Um, and this stance often unconflictingly combines with the denial of the virus. The deniers can claim in the same sentence that the virus doesn't exist 
and that it was intentionally fabricated in a lab to do this job of whatever, reducing the world's population or reshaping the world so as to extract even more profit from it and to further subjugate us. Now, the problem is that whereas these things indeed seem to describe well the direction that we are heading, that is to say, uh, reducing the world population, reshaping the world to extract even more profit from it, further subjugate us, these are not uh, fantasies. I mean, this is obviously something that we are going towards. But whereas these things indeed seem to be, to describe well the direction that we are heading to the move, the very move that points to the conspiracy behind it functions, in this case, I would claim as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it functions as fantasy. Now, let me try to explain this. Uh, regarding the kind of critical or emancipatory potential of conspiracy theories, I think they have two major problems or limits. The first limit is this strange belief that by exposing who is behind some problem or that there is someone behind it, um, the, uh, the belief that in this case, the reality of the problem disappears. So if, let's say, the virus was invented by the Chinese or by the financial elites, then the problem, the problem it poses for us socially, biologically, and so on, simply disappears or dissipates. The entire emphasis is on revealing the hidden background. The reality of what is going on right in front of our eyes kind of fades out in relation to the exposing of the secret cause, the secret source of what is going on. This becomes the main investment and the principal passion. And this passion perfectly matches with the impassive, cynical attitude that may look as its opposite. Namely, both these attitudes satisfy themselves with the conclusion that we are not as stupid as to buy the appearances and the official explanation. As if the ultimate primal fear of conspiracy theorists is that they would turn out to be the naive dupes, fools who didn't know any better. And just one a brief quote taken randomly for, from Facebook in all this, whatever, COVID conspiracy uh, polemic, uh, somebody wrote, I knew this early last April, that all this had been planned. If you are smart, you realize it immediately. They won't get to fool me. You see, there is really a kind of incredible um, uh, emphasis on this, and this had some other social reasons, why right? this kind of uh, uh, fear of not being a fool uh, is so uh, important here. Uh, that, uh, and I think this is precisely one of the points when one would need to intervene and to stop the doors from closing upon this kind of satisfaction with our better knowledge. You can say, yes, it is absolutely true that, excuse my language, we are getting screwed from all sides and for some time now. But by rushing to announce that we know very well that we are being screwed, we do very little, if anything, about the fact that we are getting screwed and in what ways. <laughs> the screwing goes on undisturbed. Moreover, in order for this screwing to continue, it needs our solace, our consolation in the fact that we know it very well. <laughs> so the reality which is now explained by us being screwed in ten in intentionally continues as it is. In this gesture, we declare the reality to be a fiction and the conspiracy to be the only real. So instead of dealing with reality, engaging with reality, we replace it with the reality of conspiracy. Since the result, it is the result of conspiracy, reality acquires the status of something unreal almost, which is both false and very dangerous, politically dangerous assumption. Now the other, I think even perhaps more acute problem of conspiracy theories on, of the, the modality, their modality in relationship again to any idea of emancipation is the way in which they block what we could call like the window of opportunity, let's say, opened by the contingencies, by the contingency of what happened 
and this move to immediately disavow the element of surprise. Uh, the fundamental claims of this conspirational mood are, let's say, at least two. First, that they knew it all along and that nothing is contingent. There are no contingencies. Uh, everything is premeditated. I mean, this is a kind of a biblical first statement. There are no contingencies. So what is the problem here? Uh, very simply put, even when thoroughly premeditated, profound structural change is always inevitably a moment of risk. It involves a moment of risk and uncertainty. Things can happen, not that they will necessarily, but there, but there is uh, something undecided uh, right there. And perhaps we can say that if we are indeed running out of time, it is not because the end of the world is approaching, but because this kind of opening occurring from the combination of severe crisis of the old order, its need to restructure, the contingencies like the death of the virus and so on, this uh, uh, opening will close. Uh, this means that in relation to the end of the world fantasy, it is also not enough to just shift the emphasis, as I did earlier, and say, uh, okay, it is too late to prevent the change, which has already started, but not too late to steer it to influence where it is going and where it is going to end. And this is also something that we now often here particularly in relationship to, to the climate crisis. Um, but I think things are even more complex. The problem is even more um, complicated. And it is that not all time in this process of, of changing, not all time uh, in this process of changing has the same quality. Not all time has this susceptibility uh, susceptibly, uh, susceptibly needed in order for something to really make a difference. And of course here we can play with different uh, hypotheses, but one is also to say that uh, obviously uh, COVID pandemic did make a difference because it happened at that moment. You can say, but does this simply mean that it was meant to happen, that it was kind of, the, and this is the only thing that we can uh, get from it is to ret retroactively establish that actually the big capital, the financial capital needed something to it to get more money printed and put in their uh, account. So, or, or was it actually a moment of contingency that, that actually for the first time in the history of uh, modernity, uh, some uh, lockdown of this proportion could have happened. So is this simply, could we simply make this contingency disappear or not? What, what, what to do with this? So there are moments, I would say, when something is much more likely to make a difference than some other moments. Uh, so the, the, this question of change is not just a matter of efforts, of movements, of organizing, and of knowing roughly what you want, which obviously are all needed, but also a matter of detecting and seizing the moment of risk, the moment the, when the, the, the structure is at some kind of risk, and of recognizing it rather than disavowing it, screening it off with the image of an omnipotent big other, like we have usually in the uh, conspiracy theories. So differently from what the conspiracy theories are trying to convince us, the big other, whatever, the elites, those in power, uh, big corporations, so on, they don't know exactly what they are doing and don't control everything. There are frictions, there are contradictions, there is exposure to contingency and risk, particularly in moments of change and of profound restructuring. And yes, of course, the elites are surely in a very good privileged position to manage this risk. They have the means to turn contingencies to their own advantage and to enforce on us their version of the brave new world instead of some other. But I think it's also painful to watch how much critical energy goes in the denial of the fact that we and them are living through a moment of risk. Denial that this could be 
a rare moment when things could take a different direction, perhaps. Um, the claim that they, the elites, are behind the whole change, including all contingencies, and orchestrate the change down to the least detail is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It does, in fact, give the elites the time and the opportunity to consolidate around the new facts and new contingencies. While the civil society is fighting around the question whether in the matter, I don't know, of the virus, of climate change, or, or the economy, we should trust science or not. Uh, during the time, elites are indeed getting consolidated, new elites are getting formed, and genuine social revolution is passing right outside our windows. Uh, and we deliberately are taking no part of it because we either are too smart, we know it's all fake, or else forced to assume the kind of conservative position in this game like we mostly are today, longing for the good old times when mainstream media still had some influence, when science was respected and its findings taken seriously. You know, it's kind of paradoxical that the same people who were critical in the past towards precisely this kind of spontaneous ideology of science and especially towards its growing integration in the economy of growth and its often happy marriage with capital, the same people are now forced to defend science, mainstream media, and the good old times, uh, which they, which we used to be so critical about. So some even say that it is their, our fault, that these critical voices in the past have brought on us the present deluge of distrust in science, in authorities, in the media, in anything official. This is usually this kind of um, liberal right-wing agenda of uh, distrust in the light. Uh, so, but I have an alternative theory for you. Conspiracy theories and all sorts of denial are strongly encouraged by the elites because they keep the critical progressive voices busy fighting on the side of conservative agenda. Uh, there is the virus and then there is the virus of denial. Uh, and perhaps the elites, I don't think they invented the virus, but it looks like they, they could have invented and spread the virus of denial, even if they don't necessarily take its side. The later does, in fact, come very handy. If the vast, just this kind of a very simplistic mental experiment, if the vast majority of people simply and gladly embrace the vaccines as solution to the pandemic, we wouldn't be in this frenzy of social warfare in the bonfire of which the elites can indeed calmly carry out what the conspirationalists charge them with, reshape the world according to their own solipsistic vision. And in this sense, I was saying about that this is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And this warfare, this social uh, warfare on social media, in, I, I know it's not the same in all the countries, but I think it uh, does happen in many countries. It does happen in Slovenia very much so. Uh, and it is really kind of, um, itself, I would say that the most uh, uh, pressing or the most uh, acutant symptom of, uh, of this time. So to, to go back, and I will uh, conclude with this, to this kind of idea of seizing the, the certain moment of, of risk, I mean, the, the risk that is there, uh, it is, we could say that once the reconsolidation takes place and new order gets more firmly on its trails, uh, the time for to reshape it uh, will be out, or in any ways, it will be much more difficult. Any significant reshape will become, again, officially and also perhaps physically an impossible task. So perhaps the least one could say, apropos of this reshape project that you are running here, or we're running here, is that its timing is perfect. Uh, not simply because it is urgent to change the way things are functioning in the arts world and in general, but because of how things will function if the change which is already happening will simply follow its natural course. So I think to think differently and to act differently, to practice differently is indeed a very 
um, thing to do at this time. So I will stop now. I know that, that, that there will be probably some discussion about uh, more directly related perhaps to, to the art and to the word, uh, role of art in this, but uh, just for the talk, I wanted to keep to whatever my uh, trade, and then I will, in the discussion, perhaps risk, risk some hypotheses. But I, I, I think at the same time that I know I have this perhaps idealistic or uh, uh, perspective on art as something that, although it is very much part of this world that we are talking about, it is at the same time also always out of this world, and it is. Uh, very often by this other dimension of being out of this world, which means that it does not necessarily um, work only with what is here and with the, within the frame of possibilities that are presented, and then something else is created, creative, not uh, created not necessarily uh, out of wanting to be created or out of some kind of purposeful research, but sometimes also out of pure art, so to say, out of the art doing is its um, work. Okay, I will, I will stop now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alenka. Uh, maybe before going straight to the art, or maybe just uh, touching it a little bit, um, uh, uh, the notion of change was uh, very much mentioned uh, in your lecture, and actually our conference or the whole project is dealing with the change. Um, on one hand, the change you were, um, or as, at least I perceive it, that the change you're mentioning was um, in, mentioned in the negative sense, you know, the change is always going towards the end of the world uh, or uh, towards some kind of a destruction, while when we are, when we are talking about the change, uh, we, I can say for, for many of my colleagues, we are thinking about positive change or doing things differently, or at least in a way uh, we think might be better not only for us, but for the majority um, of the society. and. Um, uh, also, I can. Uh, it is very clear that uh, the notion of fantasy and the change are very much intertwined, and uh, it reminded me uh, of an artwork by um, Igor Grubic, a Croatian artist, um, who did a series of small post-its um, with, um, with, with just one sentence saying, um, same as you, I'm waiting for a change. When it happens, let me know, and signed by a passive citizen. Uh, in a way, uh, commenting that um, um, maybe this goes in line with what, you're, with what you were saying, that, uh, uh, that, that we are very comfortable with the position of uh, either waiting for a change or fa fantasizing about the change or the end, but never uh, actually having a courage to, as you say, risk it and to actually do it. Uh, but I was thinking that um, can we maybe use this fantasy as a, as a, as an incentive to uh, actually to to, um, to become active citizens or to uh, uh, get into the action? Uh, can a fantasy uh, at least um, sketch um, a desirable future, so to say? Uh, and what is your view on that? Uh, yeah, thank you for these comments. Uh, I know that I'm kind of, uh, uh, that I kind of hit this ground from a side to some extent. And so, I mean, for me also, like philosophically speaking, I mean, it is difficult to simply a priori uh, distinguish between good and bad change, or to say, uh, I mean, in this sense, you, have, you would have to argue that only good change is change. But I think there are changes. I mean, there are things that could be called changes that are not good. I mean, in the sense of what, of how we would like to see the world, but they are nevertheless a very, very profound changes, mm -hmm. which do uh, change the world, the way we think about ourselves, the way we think about the world, and so on. So it is not, uh, so I obviously, I understand that what is, what was behind this project is precisely how to bring about a certain kind of of change or a change in the world that would uh, lead to a different, uh, more, let's say, um, uh, 
um, communal and uh, solidarity and so on ways of living in the world, which uh, obviously also I can only uh, subscribe to as well. But when thinking about the change, I think perhaps this is precisely the part of the problem of this passage from this, uh, let's say, old world to the new one, because I really think something is happening here, is that we are only looking for the good change, or uh, thinking about the how, who, and uh, perhaps we have some, some how missed the moment when things started to change, really changing, and uh, how to catch the, I mean, not the train of this change, but how really how to get on in and steer it in a different direction, not just keep on thinking about our change, but, uh, so I don't know, I'm just like throwing up, out, throwing up, throwing out <laughs> hypothesis, but uh, I think that this question of the change is indeed quite uh, important, and I think there is this kind of, there was this kind of psychological moment where we were all like, hoping for a change or trying for something to happen. But for me, it really kind of translates in this modality of, oh God, let something happen, even if it is a complete uh, end of the world, but it, at least it will bring us out of this kind of enclosure, of this kind of um, um, that time, this kind of idea that we are going around in circles, that whatever we do, uh, even uh, in the most radical, also artistic way and so on, is so, in one way or another, um, exploited or brought back to this machine of capital and the, or, or else one is completely excluded. So this is, and I think now the, with the change, the exclusion is becoming massive. I mean, there is, I think, uh, very little uh, or n not so much care taken about how to include all this, it just lets just get them out and die. I mean, this is, uh, uh, but so, uh, but somehow uh, I, I have the impression that uh, while wanting the change to, to, to arrive, we perhaps missed that in a way it has arrived, but not in the, the same form that we were hoping for. But mm. we cannot ignore it because it's not of the same form. It, uh, this, is, this is what I wanted to bring together at the end mm -hmm. of my talk, that precisely it is, of course, the moment to, yeah, whatever, to engage with reality in this way uh, and to try to shape it otherwise. But uh, it is not somewhere in the future. I think it is right now. It is the moment. Mm. Although, I mean, uh, w w what I notice uh, uh, if we are talking about the pandemic as uh, some huge change uh, that came and that came really abruptly uh, in a couple of weeks, we were all... Uh, lockdown, uh, at least at, uh, in this part of Europe. Um, uh, uh, and if you say that we were hoping for something to change, uh, even if it's uh, for the worse, um, now with some times uh, that has passed, I can see that um, we so easily are trying to find our way back to the old tracks. Uh, uh, like that, um, as you were saying, that we kind of ignore um, not that we are ignoring the fact that the pandemic is here, but uh, uh, like we didn't embrace it, but we are fighting as much as we can to kind of get back uh, to, to the old normal. Um, and in this way, uh, maybe we really miss the train. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, the, there definitely was this moment at the beginning of the pandemic, which was a very exciting moment because the impossible happened, so to say. This was at least the impression. All of a sudden, this, everything stopped. I mean, this was a kind of spectacular yeah. uh, thing to, to, to witness. Uh, and then this kind of temporality settled in, which was that of uh, uh, going on of something which was not so good. I mean, the, 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 the suffering of these lo lockdowns were quite uh, considerable uh, and yeah and then this question of normality and re returning back to normality which was there also from the very beginning and with this idea also that you know the the, the normality that we will be returning to is actually being created right now during the uh, the very pandemic what is this because now we are obviously we are tired of the of the lockdown but uh, the, the return to normalcy has on, on one hand this kind of a uh, um, nice um, feeling of uh, kind of going back to some practices that we really liked uh, like i don't know uh, 
going out with people, going to theater, going to different arts uh, events and so on, uh, and that we really uh, were missing. So this is yeah, a normal that we would like to uh, get back to, but at the same time, it's not at all uh, clear that this is the normal that we are getting back to. I, I'm not sure what, I mean, it's still, at least here, it's not sure at all when we mm -hmm. will wake up uh, tomorrow or, or and because other things are happening at the same time. But uh, no, but I think perhaps even more importantly, uh, you, you said, uh, you asked two questions before and one was about um, possible value of fantasy. Can, could fantasies uh, kind of drive us to action? Could they be also, uh, yes, of course they could, but uh, um, again here I'm kind of uh, playing also kind of devil advocate. I mean, I use the fantasy in this more negative sense, mm -hmm. as I described at the beginning, in the way that they can drive you to action. I mean, uh, anti-Semitic fantasies did drive people to action. <laughs> there is no, uh, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but the question is precisely what kind of motivation to action you get, and I don't mm -hmm. think Fantasy in this way that I, uh, in this sense that I use the term, is the best motivation. But it works. Clearly, it works, and it's being done in this uh, populist uh, way uh, all the time. I mean, now the the rise of populism is the rise of uh, uh, political fantasies in the sense that do drive people to action and to reaction. But uh, the, it's definitely uh, there. So this is why I think um, one of the things that I wanted to stress is that. If art is of value here, is precisely because it has an alternative model to offer than that of fantasy. In mm -hmm. again, this precise mm -hmm. sense of the word. Thank you. Uh, maybe I would now open for uh, questions of the audience. Uh, First time I've said anything in a microphone with a mask on. <laughs> Um, um, <laughs> could you please just a little bit diminish the lights because I cannot see anybody because of, uh, uh, thank you. I'm interested that you use the metaphor of steering, which is a very powerful one. And of course you can't steer anything if you're not in it. You can't steer a <laughs> yeah. machine if you're not inside of it. You can't steer a herd of cows if you're not in within yeah, the yeah. group. How do you reconcile that with what you were saying about art? which can offer alternatives. And to me, that looks like outside of the mm. thing that you're trying to steer. Mm. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is uh, obviously a very difficult question and the very word or metaphor of steering it has its uh, limits, I would put it like this, because it's also that you, you could also say that you can steer something it is, if it's already moving and if it is already has the, the power, the force to, to, to move or to, to do something. So, uh, so the idea, the basic, the only idea very simple behind this metaphor was to say that, okay, we are somehow part of the world that is changing. Also, uh, artists as part are part of the world that is changing, and that in this sense we are within something, but not uh, within it all the way. And I think this is precisely a good point that this is not simply we are not completely absorbed into this machine, but that, that there is not only a reflection going on, but that there also this kind of openness to certain contingency that I think is also very much part of how I think uh, uh, art functions in, in, in a way, not contingency that's do, doing anything goes, but in the sense that there, there, uh, this um, sensibility of uh, recognizing the right sound, the right moment, the right, it's something that I think it's very much part for me of the artistic sensibility, that it's a kind of a, uh, not uh, recognizing something that is not obvious perhaps, that is not, uh, uh, they're in plain uh, side, but that you recognize as something that you could work with or do something with it. So this in a sense, but obviously if we are talking about what power does art or artistic community have within this changing world, the, the, this question is very tough because it, uh, I would say in this kind of us, artistic community as such, it has very little power as most of us do. I mean, it's, it's clearly, it's clear that power, like the real power, is elsewhere. 
So uh, in this sense, uh, yeah, we can do a lot of gesturing, but literal steering. So I would uh, kind of agree that this is to be taken with some uh, grain of salt, this, uh, this metaphor. It's just the, uh, but at the same, I mean, my basic uh, idea was even not so much let's steer and work as it was let's be attentive or let's be open to this idea that not everything is determined, not everything is uh, being uh, controlled and that things do happen from time to time. So then how to actually um, organize around this kind of uh, surprising emergencies of this or that, this is a much more complicated problem and I think it is ultimately a political problem. I don't think, at least this is my kind of personal take, but I don't think here art can replace politics in this, not in this sense of everyday politics, but in this like sense of like emancipatory po politics as uh, a practice, as a practice of thinking, of thinking uh, emancipatory processes and of uh, living, um, uh, of thinking of the social in a, uh, in a certain way. So um, it's not, the, I don't think one can expect any kind of direct um, recipes or uh, models that could just function universally in, uh, I mean, it's a global, global issue also. This is another problem. It's not, I, I think the way we, even though now it seems that walls are growing up and that we were, uh, after the global uh, era of globalization, we will perhaps again, again see this kind of segregation taking place much more um, intensely, uh, but still world is global, even if we will be segregated. I mean, the, the, uh, um, other things, uh, other powers that, uh, that steer it are still very much connected. And so it is very difficult also to just, um, yeah, influence the, this kind of uh, uh, huge machine. But I don't know, sometimes you never know with, when if just a small thing somewhere can have um, an impact, an effect which one cannot anticipate in advance by saying, okay, if we will remove this cork, then something, uh, it sometimes also happens. And then I really think it is a political or social uh, sensibility and um, wisdom to to recognize this and to try to um, kind of militantly point to it and engage with it and so on. So it's not just uh, it will happen and we will we won't need to do anything. Uh, obviously, it would demand some serious engagement. But uh, so I don't know. Some thought that the the uh, the, the COVID thing was or did at some point uh, present some kind of opportunity for something like this to happen. And uh, But to, if we look at it now, I don't think this is uh, what is going on. So, But I don't think from this we can conclude there was never any chance because this is the only move that I'm kind of trying to go against. That retroactively didn't say, okay, th there was never a chance. Okay, um, uh, particularly if this means uh, and there never will be. But okay, there are also people who actually claim that this kind of ultimate fat fatalism or giving in to say nothing can change is the best ground for a change to I mean, come on. So there are different uh, schools there. But, uh, but it's, yeah, obviously it's a very uh, difficult uh, question. Uh, more comments or questions? Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk and thank you actually very much for reminding me and us, um, probably all of us, that um, as you said art is in but it's also so like outside of this world. Because I think, um, this is more of a comment not a question, I think uh, not a comment for you but maybe for uh, the art society or institutionalized art society that in last, I don't know, 20, 15, 20 years art was actually a bit uh, pushed away in a sense of, uh, and was replaced by all its, like the social functions, the uh, political activism, which I um, am up like 
I'm for it, and I did that kind of work also, it's not I'm against, but art per se was forgotten, like it do, that it doesn't have any power, that it's, and like in European um, found, founding, it's not, it's really difficult to apply with art projects. Mm. You can apply with all the uh, dancing around the monuments and have, being happy together as European nations, and so, um, so thank you for reminding us that art is somewhere, and we can reach it, and maybe we can find something new with it. Uh, yeah, I would just briefly not reply to this, but uh, kind of add my, I mean, uh, the way you put it, that uh, uh, there, are no, there is no founding for art <laughs> as art. Uh, I think uh, I could pretty much say the same thing for philosophy. There is no founding for philosophy. As philosophy, we always need to serve some purpose, even if it's a good cause, but it, you, you need to be related to some kind of uh, uh, social um, infrastructure, uh, so social cause, and this is kind of paradoxical sometimes because I think sometimes it really works, but very often it's as if this were precisely the way of not getting or not letting the art involve. It. I mean, I think art is a social practice. I mean, it is uh, per se a social practice. It is not uh, kind of uh, something else, and it uh, has audience or in principle at least. So it's not that it is, uh, if it's pure art, then uh, it, um, it doesn't present any kind of social stake or social claim. Uh, but uh, it is true that uh, these times, uh, which are also very efficient, efficiently run, are not uh, so much uh, um, in favor of these kind of things that serve no immediate purpose, and which is a kind of, uh, way, I mean, I'm not sure that this describes art the best, but it is because it is obviously it is serious engagement and serious work, and it is sweating and it's everything. It's not like a kind of contemplation of aesthetical contemplation of whatever, but still it is a very specific kind of work and a specific kind of engagement, which is, I guess, and I think, uh, uh, extremely precious. Uh, in itself, uh, but I would also, uh, if I may uh, uh, add, we were talking about this a little bit before uh, um, the, the conference started. Uh, you know, th there were times in history when art had a very different function in society, when it was actually central to, I mean, it was the way in which society taught and represented itself, I mean, like the mainstream way, uh, if kind of, uh, so, uh, but these were pre modern there were, the, in modernity kind of gave autonomy to art and liberated it from a certain, uh, in a certain way from this kind of uh, immediate social functions that it fulfilled uh, before. So you can say, okay, this comes with a price uh, that the, the, the influence, the, the immediate, the, the impact that the art could have on the social is also lesser now, I don't know. But the, the question is then whether we want to come back to these times when art was, uh, kind of more organically uh, integrated in society. I don't know, I don't think we can go back to anything. But I do think that there will, there probably there will be future and the position of art in society will change. I don't think this will just remain uh, as it is. But what, in what way or how, this is a different question. And I guess it's still open, an open question, yeah. Okay. I yeah, wanted no. to say uh, something, but then uh, Sorry. a whole new topic opened, so it is also <laughs> interesting about the autonomy <laughs> of arts and uh, how we would like it, like how or how we would like to be tied to the society, better mm. to say maybe. But uh, let's get back to the, the first thing, the, like uh, just a small reflection I liked. I really appreciate uh, how realistically you explain the present moment and uh, the, also the um, risk uh, that is ne needed to be taken and like a possibility to take the, the risk because the, the whole system is actually unstable and we don't uh, like uh, lots of times, at least in our experience, I'm talking from the uh, perspective of um, like 
managing board of the Association of uh, Fine Artists from Serbia that has more like around 2,600 uh, uh, um, members. And uh, we know like um, from this uh, short uh, ma mandate that we had like of one year and a half, like how very differently people um, are um, acting in, in um, um, independence of what is the, their like uh, base, like what is their like uh, how involved they are in uh, uh, um, involved in a society to work. If they are employed or independent artists or mm -hmm. like uh, entrepreneurs or, and so, and so we can see like that uh, there is this um, that. Uh, there is every time less and less uh, stable jobs and that uh, the people actually who are having and still maintaining some stable jobs are much less eager to take uh, risks than for example independent uh, artists and there is like you were talking a lot about the uh, change but like uh, we are actually in a struggle going on and it is also interesting to talk about, uh, like, to uh, what you are saying also about. Um, I'm just jumping now from one question to another because there was uh, a lot of different things. Uh, while uh, there is going on the, uh, this uh, a counter, um, a counter vax. Uh, mm -hmm. anti-vaxxer yes. like, uh, uh, anti mo movements so the, like uh, this is something that uh, goes well the political agenda blah blah because it uh, takes our time and also uh, what we are doing uh, like we are like also trying to um, just to identify like the uh, direction of uh, like unique uh, uh, for the unique action and uh, struggle why they, there is all these identity politics that are like tearing us apart and like breaking these struggles into very uh, different uh, you know like struggles and all, all, all this uh, like a, a bureaucracy uh, a fetishism that we are uh, uh, comes on us and we are like be all the time busy like just doing bureaucracy and not having time like just like uh, to do what we think we should uh, do and to maintain this uh, direction and uh, like yeah so many things. maybe not having but time to take risk uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and also yeah uh, like just to get back to the point like uh, uh, Less, you know, like, and this is something really like uh, optimistic that comes up in, uh, from this um, lecture uh, for me, is that uh, we we have to realize that the system is in, unstable and that people have to take risks, and that, that uh, there is a more and more unstable uh, positions. Like uh, the, there is uh, more uh, instability, and we just have to like somehow realize and to, uh, yeah, and to, yeah, like uh, act and take risks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think like encouraging. I, mean, the, uh, yeah. I was also uh, um, emphasizing the risk, which is there. I mean, also the the, the so-called the, the system players, the big players. I mean, they also are exposed to risk. This, uh, and I was also talking about this risk when uh, even when uh, big capital uh, goes into some kind of uh, profound uh, transformation or even if when when within the very circulation of capital there are moments of risk this is why credits come up because there is this moment of dead money of dead capital which doesn't circulate so there are these moments of risk within not only that uh, i'm not only kind of um, preaching this kind of heroism of we have to take risk and which it's good that we do but it's also that uh, to recognize that there are moments of risk in the way in which uh, uh, the system works and uh, if we belong to it in some ways inevitably um, use these moments of risk as well in our risking something but the, what you described before this kind of uh, whatever um, discussions and endless polemics i mean it 
proof goes to the fact that the art community or whatever kind of uh, is part of the world in the it kind of reflects the same problems that are there in other uh, whatever communities and i think it is the, the fact that uh, these kind of vocations like uh, scientist philosopher artist uh, i mean this is this has all changed we are all scientific workers uh, art workers uh, philosophical workers i mean there is this kind of a uh, um, inclusion into the, 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 yeah, the usual trade economies of the trade. And it is this is kind of exceptional uh, 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 ring that, uh, that was associated with this kind of uh, callings or it's kind of uh, not really disappearing, but it worked very differently. And this is, you know, that the scientists are complaining all the time how uh, there is all this quantification of their work, you know, that, that their excellence needs to be proven by whatever points that they make. I mean, this, you talk bureaucratization. I mean, this is something uh, a very, very um, um, I don't know, nefast pro uh, process going on in uh, all around, I would say, uh, uh, this uh, section of uh, uh, not real economy, but what is this kind of a real economy of uh, of thinking of creating its own creative economy, if you want, but it's still driven into it. So yeah, I, I don't know, it's, um, it is uh, surely there. But yeah, the risk is also not uh, only our risk, but also the um, moments of risk. I was talking, also referring to these moments of slight exposure, perhaps, that happened to also to, uh, to those who are well protected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I'd like also to build on this. We were we talking about risk, but actually, I think it's um, rooted and strongly related to the notion of failure. This aversion. I'm here. If you look. Oh, no. Where can you? I am here. <laughs> <It's> so <disturbing. laughs> oh, sorry. It's so disturbing. Just it's it's okay. so to know when the fall voice comes from. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I think that this aversion, this resistance to take a risk is this fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And um, I think where the art community is the strongest, and it's also paradoxical in a society that today prizes science and technology of, uh, um, over art and spiritu mm. spirituality, while everybody accepts that all science is about trial, failure, and retrial. Mm. However, our society, in a way, with at least my generation, has been educated. We uh, sanction failure. We um, don't consider that there is some positive in the failure, in the trial. And I think mm. and somehow um, the whole society has this subconscious, strong fear of taking a risk because I may fail. And of course, failure in the absolute is not necessarily all positive. But I think there where we have added value because the artists and the creatives are the first one who are open to this taken risk, open to opening. Mm. And I think that's where we are the strongest. And then I think that's where we should work more on creating the, the society that it's failure, has a failure acceptance somehow to, yes, let's try. And then of course it's not, always bad to fail but it's bad it's good to learn from your failure uh, yeah no thank you very much for bringing bringing in this uh, notion of failure which uh, also has itself some uh, history in the history of art you know this famous famous uh, lines from Beckett uh, fail again fail better and so on uh, but uh, I think it's also to some uh, extent at least related to what I was um, discussing under a slightly different name uh, of this uh, uh, fear that many people have today of being made, f uh, turning out to be the fools or the dupes of, uh, of something. And I think it is a very, uh, I think you are right that um, art can have a strong resistance or strong, let's say, uh, self-conscious when it comes to this question, what if am I, I'm a fool? I doesn't, I don't really, care so much if I, uh, so whereas 
um, the way the, the word functions these times, it, I think it's really uh, pathologically obsessed with this idea. And uh, also, I'm not saying pathologic. I mean, I'm talking that this quote, it was probably from someone, I don't know, these are not some um, clever big players, but let's say ordinary people, whatever, I hate to use this term because <laughs> I don't know what it actually means, but uh, it is simply this, why uh, this, why is this the last thing that we would cling on to when everything else is dissolving? It's just that we have to prove that we know what is going on, and then we'll, this is in itself some kind of salvation. Otherwise, it's just um, too damn difficult to, to, to cope with. So, uh, and yeah, and this is a kind of critical moment. Again, if one is too afraid of being made a fool, or being uh, declared naive, then I think one is also much more up, up, up to uh, failing to uh, to create something or to seize this kind of uh, seize, to to act on certain things that are actually could lead somewhere else. So it's uh, yeah, it is important. It is not, but not to make some kind of a whatever. Um, um, elegy of failure, but I think it is important. I, I would really connect it to this kind of uh, modality of existing and of thinking where one is not afraid to be, to turn out to be a na naive. I think this is very much what is missing today. If we were more naive, things could not have taken, certain things at least could not take him. And now it's just this kind of, uh, oh, but we, we know it. We know that everything, all the politicians are dirty, everything. We are over clever in a way. And I think this is not a good uh, political climate, that we should perhaps be a little bit more trained in uh, naivety and this kind of genuine surprise at things that uh, not only uh, outrage, but kind of surprise, how is this possible? This kind of ontological surprise, how is this possible? I think that we can have a, 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 another question, and that's it, because we're running out of time. OK, hey. Um, I have a short comment first, and then I'll have a question. Um, so um, you were talking about change and about the train that was um, the coronavirus virus, a train that we didn't catch. And I would like to say that I agree with you. Um, but I also have kind of an answer to why we didn't catch that yeah. train. And my answer would be, to put it bluntly, because, because there was no train. And <laughs> what I mean is, um, two weeks ago, I was at a um, conference of the Slovenian left party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, just to, to say, there were 15 people there, and three were members of, the par members of parliament. So what I mean is, um, mm. why we didn't get on the train, why there wasn't no train, because there was no mm. political infrastructure, there was no mm. mass movement. And uh, my question would mm. be, um, why do you think that people are so um, unwilling to join um, political causes and um, why, you know, we can talk about politics while we're talking about art. It's uh, more than yeah, 100 yeah, people yeah. here, but not, not when directly. We're talking, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. directly, so mm. uh, wh where is this, um, mm. why is this not happening? No, thank you very much for this question. I could not agree more with what you said in your kind of answer to why. Uh, I think uh, this is precisely the point. It's not because obviously it's not enough just for the moment to be there or whatever. Uh, what we would need is a much more massive movement on the level of also direct political organization. And I think it's a very, very good question why this is not happening, why we need to think politics through all these other I mean, all other spheres around politics are being politicized in the sense of the political thinking in go is going on uh, in all kinds of different uh, domains, uh, um, except in politics, or very rarely in politics. And this is, I guess, it is part of the, uh, the, the, the effect of the uh, new liberal agenda, which obviously de depoliticized politics. I mean, this was kind of a very, very important uh, uh, direction uh, the politics took the politics took after a certain moment when uh, uh, neoliberalism really really started to to achieve its uh, it to to rise and to achieve its peak which was precisely and also i mean coming from this 
part of the world, uh, ex Yugoslavia and so on, the whole um, catchword was depolitization of you know the, of everything, including politics, because precisely politizations. Mean, I mean, it is a very uh, interesting and complex question. I don't think it could have uh, the same answer in every environment, but still, I, I really believe that there is. Uh, yeah, it is very symptomatic that when it comes to political meetings, it is not there. But I don't know, perhaps I'm being uh, too optimistic here, but perhaps this thing is changing now. I don't know. I, I do detect at least some interest in politics, politics, which was not there at all so, a while ago. So, uh, but, uh, but partly it's also related, I guess, to the question that it's always on the agenda whether uh, parties who are part of this system, whatever, even if they're in opposition, can even be the place of where some kind of genuine emancipatory uh, ideas could take place, or we need to look uh, uh, completely outside of every uh, infrastructure, which I don't think uh, is the case, but uh, there, there is this general um, yeah, uh, discontent with uh, politics and this kind of democratic uh, parliamentary politics as it went on for decades now, which actually, in fact, did uh, nothing else most of the time, but to allow this or that um, center, centers of interest, of capital interest, to, to, to have their way. I mean, the, there is, uh, politics was not uh, emancipated at all in this, in perhaps uh, this, the first move would, would be to kind of emancipate, em, emancipate politics itself, <laughs> and then we could have emancipatory politics, but it is, but yeah, no, uh, but, but I agree this is, there is no train uh, uh, to speak of on which uh, we could jump even if we saw the, <laughs> the, the right moment. This, uh, I agree. I'll just quickly Sorry. jump yeah. to so we will. maybe oppose you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, uh, at least in Zagreb where I came from, uh, I think that uh, something mm. uh, drastically changed in politics in the way yeah, uh, yeah. We, we organized it or mm. the way we started. And you are very much part of it. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm now uh, uh, taking, uh, speaking, <laughs> uh, I don't know what's the term in English, but hvalim vlasti to konja. You know, uh, saying good I things about my own, own horse. <laughs> uh, so no, not a train, but a horse. Perhaps <laughs> look for a horse. <laughs> um, uh, but, but anyways, uh, and I, I think that this didn't happen by accident. Uh, that this was, I, I can, I, I can say, uh, that this was happening or preparing for a long, long time. And maybe we took, mm. finally, we, we we found a moment uh, uh, that where we were brave enough. Uh, or maybe we were just like um, saying it's either now or never because time is running out and we're getting too old <laughs> to get into this. Um, and I think that this at least sparked uh, uh, some kind of hope that uh, politics can be done in a different way. Uh, we are at the beginning, so maybe in a four years, who knows where we will be. Uh, maybe even better, maybe. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I, I really says very much. No, I mean, this is great, but I really, I will conclude immediately. I really think that things are, I mean, people are getting mobilized, not always for the best ideas, but I think something is uh, happening. <laughs> but where, where yeah, yeah what? we'll see. Thank you very much for having patience. And, uh, thank you.